And we are back with William. I'm sure you are as fascinated with this as I am. Horrible as it is, I think there are lots of lessons in this for all of us. And I cannot wait to continue with segment two. William, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming here and bearing your your personal life with, with us. I'm sure you've done many, many interviews before. Uh, yeah, I've done a few. Yeah. I mean, but it's my pleasure. And like I said at the beginning of this, you know, um, our silence is their greatest weapon. Mm -hmm. and, and really, I think when part of what I'm trying to do and everything I'm doing is giving survivors uh, a reason to come forward by changing the laws and them enabling them to have their voice. You know, once you come out, the truth sets you free. You really can't be touched by it anymore. But people do need a reason to come forward. One of the most empowering women I know that I truly admire and look up to is a spiritual teacher, and her name is Joyce Myers. And the reason I love her so much is because, I, I should add respect, is because she was abused by her father, she says, over 200 times before she was 17. And she stands in front of millions of people all over the world, and she it's very graphic. I mean, she doesn't tell you step by step what happened, but she doesn't try to hide it. She mm -hmm. doesn't make a secret of it. And she has helped many, many people. And I believe when these things happen, the best gift you can give to others is by not hiding it and trying to help them. And when you're being brave and bold like you are, and like she is, and others like you are, you're really helping a lot more people than you realize, especially when you have a medium such as television to get the word out, so. I'm grateful to be able to do it. Yeah, you know? I'm grateful <clears throat> that you've allowed my show to tell your story as well. So, we've covered seg segment one, which you talked about the incident, mm -hmm. and uh, I figured, I thought it would be good in this segment to talk briefly about your court trial and why you think you were exonerated. And then tell us about your foundation, but we'll start with your court case. Okay. Uh, after, the, after the incident went down, um, ironically, you know, three days later, the police are at my door. I was, uh, I don't know, there's just a lot of irony around it, you know. I've been trying for 15 years to get charges brought against this guy after living with the abuse for 20 years at that point yeah. so a total of 35 years i'm like really three days you guys are here um at the time i wasn't really sure what had happened i know that when we were i was hitting him pretty hard and um <clears throat> like in the base of the skull and so i just thought that there's a possibility he might have died and the police were outside the door and um I wasn't going out there. Were you petrified? No, I mean, I wasn't surprised, I wasn't petrified, but I was thinking, wow, you know what? I need a really good attorney. And, uh, and so I called up uh, Mark Garagos, of Garagos and Garagos, yeah. and he's, he's a big time attorney, representing a lot of people. And fortunately, the um, receptionist, like they have a, typically like someone calls a receptionist and then they, if they think you might be a case they want, they kind of put you through the, the junior staff and whatever, but she, I just, I just said, you know, I'm, the police are at my door. I think I may have possibly killed this priest who molested me and, and I, I need help. <laughs> and she um, forced the call through to Pat Harris, who worked in that office, who I spoke with. He looked on the internet for two minutes and just said, okay, we're gonna help you out. And I'm getting chills while you're saying that, I don't know why. Yeah, they were staking <laughs> me out, so I had to sort of sneak out of my house um, and they flew me down to LA and the best thing that ever could have happened to me was working with these these guys I mean but you mean the attorney the attorneys yeah. um, I mean Pat Harris and you know Mark Garagos and, and then Paul Monis was brought in uh, a little bit later because he's sort of a specialist who deals with people who have attacked their abusers um, you know or killed their abusers or, or whatnot but I had a great legal team and I'm sure that um, I'm sure the DA's office in San Jose was like, really? And one interesting thing also was we negotiated a surrender once I got the attorney, and they didn't do anything for six months. I think they were just hoping it would just go away. But I know that in this litigious society that we're in, uh -huh. you know, we could, we could force the issue, which I did. I told the attorneys, I'm like, I don't want this to go away. 
I want to make sure that they arrest me and we go to, to trial and do this. Why didn't you want it to go away? Because I wanted to say what needed to be said. Uh -huh. and, and I said, so I know we can force their hand because um, you know they don't want to be sued if I go and do something else or whatnot. And so we were able to do that. And once we, we were also looking at possibly doing another, another civil suit. And once they got wind of that, two days after that, they called me in and I surrendered. I was in jail for half a day and, and they got me out. And then I met with my attorneys and I told them right from the very beginning, I'm like, I'm, I do not want a plea deal. I don't, it, I'm, there's nothing I'm gonna settle here. I'm absolutely gonna go on stand. I'm, I'll take responsibility for what mm -hmm. I've done, unlike Father Jerry in the Catholic Church. Um, but I'm gonna say what needs to be said and I'm gonna have my day in court and I don't care if I have to go to jail. And I could have done up to four years in prison. I, they thought maybe I'd do two the most, maybe one and a half to two. So going into this thing, I was, I was pretty calm because I, I wasn't attached to the outcome. You know, I prepared my, my family. Um, you know, I told my, my parents, I'm like, I, I am absolutely unequivocally going to jail. You need to understand this. So we got in there and uh, everything, I remember on the second day they, they, well, at first they said I couldn't talk about the molestation at all. So we're like, well, how can we build a defense if I can't mention why I went down there and did what I did? Yeah, I, like, like you I, just out of blue just decided to go beat this guy up. Ex exactly. So the judge said, well, we, we argued, well, we should be able to call some witnesses to um, attest to his credibility. And so I had three witnesses, two other victims that I had found who were related to the camping group where this happened. And then uh, one of them was the niece of Father Jerry. And he had abused all of uh, all of his brother's kids and whatever but so they and were this ready this guy is still living in society I yeah. mean seriously he's yeah, still he's, out there he's living down in, in Sacred Heart Jesuit retreat in Los Gatos and uh, you know I'm, I'm exploring a lot of different things around these issues I mean one thing I'm looking at I want to working to do a like a, a piece on these thousands of these retreats that they have that they move these priests around and looking at legal options for the municip municipalities I mean, they should, be, they should be able to say, look, we don't want these guys in our community. You brought them in, you didn't tell us. And the response from the church is, well, nobody's been convicted because of the statute of limitations has expired. So there's no record, but these people have been named in many cases. And I think there's a way that these municipalities can bring lawsuits. And so I'm exploring different stuff like that. Okay. But getting back to the trial, they, uh, they said, okay, you can talk about the molestation very generically. Like I could say I was molested. I couldn't talk about any details or whatnot. And in the second day of the trial, um, you know, I'm sure people read about it, but if you were in the courtroom, it was like the DA gets up, suborns perjury, and says, you know, we, we know he's a liar, and we know he's going to lie when we put him on the stand, and they put him on the stand, and he lied. And all of a sudden, his attorney's standing with my attorneys, arguing with the DA and the judge. His attorney's saying, we're taking the fifth. We're not talking about anything anymore. My attorneys are saying, well, now if he can't face his accuser, he didn't have a six right amendment, so he should have a mistrial, but they refused the mistrial. But the result of Father Jerry taking the fifth was that the jury was instructed to ignore everything that had to do with him in the trial, which also meant I could no longer call any witnesses. So I had nothing. Why does it seem like the law is out there to protect the, these sick people? I, I don't get it. Am I, I, I don't mean, understand the well, law, but. I mean, it should be fair for everyone. He had the right to take the fifth in that situation and whatnot. I mean, this is where we'll get into talk about the statutes and limitations. Those, you know, there's certain things within the system that, I'll talk about that a little bit more, but the, you know, all of a sudden I'm in a situation where I have no one but me. And it came down to me pretty much in the last day of the trial on the stand and, um, you know, the DA is like, you went down there, you premeditated it, you put on gloves, you thought about it for years, you <laughs> lied and made a story and went in there, you beat this guy up and did it. And I just turned to the jury, I'm like, I'm not gonna insult your intelligence, I did this, you know, but I had my reasons. And, you know, I kind of stated my case, explained what happened. I said, and I'm prepared to face justice for what I've done, but I wanted to get this out in the public, I wanted to expose Gerald Lindner and I wanted to expose the Catholic Church and the Sacred Heart Jesuit Center and give people a reason to come forward and some inspiration, you know. And uh, the end result was they, they found me not guilty through jury nullification. And jury nullification is basically, it's, 
It's an interesting situation because it's not a rule of law, but it's a right that a jury has that we've had since the inception of our system in this country. But it's also in violation of your oath as a juror. Okay. So if there wasn't, and, and a defense attorney can't say you can nullify this either. So unless someone on your jury really knows it, mm -hmm. um, it would never happen. And it, and it rarely happens. It's less than 1% of the time. But long story short, they found me not guilty. And uh, I didn't expect that at all. You know, I was definitely resigned to going, going to jail. God is not a policeman. I always say that. Yeah. Was that? God is not God a policeman? God is not a policeman. I am so happy that you were exonerated because to me, going to jail would really have been, I mean, I've, I'm just another mortal, but I'd be, you would be looking at this like, what was the purpose of my life? Because you were living in a jail after this happened to you. Yeah, I mean, I've already, I've already been Served suffering. your time, yeah. I mean, if I had gone to jail, you know, it's, I mean, it's, it's easy for me to sit here and say, I knew I was going to jail, you know, probably after a month in there, I would have been climbing the walls going, this, you know, this sucks, but, but I, I did what I felt was the right thing to do, and, and I never planned any of this, but as things evolved, you know, I started to realize there's an opportunity here um, for people to get what, what I got, you know, I, and I'm, I tell people not to do what I did. Um, I was very lucky, and this is why. I think you were blessed. Whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is, um, taking the law in your own hands is not the way to do it, but, mm -hmm. Before the trial, I posed these questions, you know, I'm like, um, where does my obligation to protect children supersede his rights? You know, I mean, right. it's almost like I'm complicit in the crime. It's like, I know this guy's a molester. I know he's molested other children and he's, and he's free to molest more children. Somebody's got to do something. So in the face of a system that fails to protect children, I took matters into my own hands and, and what happened happened. I got lucky. I don't want people to go out and do what I did. Although I do recognize, I mean, I can tell you right now, if I had children or if I was anybody out there with children, you know, if the, if, the law's not, if, yeah, if the law's not getting it done, I'll get it done, whatever mm -hmm. the consequence. Mm -hmm. And I think that the jury's um, verdict really kind of puts the trial on system and, and expose this, this gap that needs to be closed. And really now I think the system's liable. You know, I mean, essentially, if somebody does do what I did, they can come and cite my case. And this is something that needs to be addressed by the system, and we're working to change that. And like I said before, from, from this situation, I found my voice, I became empowered, and I started to be able to take my life back in a way that I couldn't before. And I'm happy that that's ha that has happened. So going forward, you're living a new life in terms of that's been dealt with. It's kind of, it will never go away, but you're in a healthier place than you were when, when it first happened. So now, what are your plans, and how are you using this to help others? I'm taking my experience and the things that I learned from that and um, putting them into the philosophy behind the organization RISE. What does uh, RISE stand for? Roots for Individual and Social Empowerment, mm -hmm. and that is uh, an advocacy organization. Basically, we're trying to change the system that allows um, pedophiles and the institutions that harbor them to keep getting away with this. And part of the problem is, um, basically, it's politics, you know, and it's, it favors those who bring the greatest resources and influence to bear, like these institutions. So you have institutions that are well-funded that are not protecting children from predators in their ranks who are lobbying, using powerful lobbyists to lobby our legislature, and the legislature is unwilling or unable to get it done, and children aren't being protected. So. My whole philosophy is taking this back to the people and bringing ballot measure and letting the people decide. You've seen a recent development. I, a lot of people didn't hear about it. It was passed just, just before the end of the year very quietly. But now the legislature has injected themselves into the ballot measure process. So the ballot measure process was the most pure form of democratic uh, you know, resolve that we could right. exercise. Now they're injecting themselves into the process. They're doing it because you're seeing a trend where people are starting to say, you know what, we have a lame duck Congress. We have, like, people aren't getting it done in politics. We're gonna get it done ourselves. So you're seeing the legislature's power erode and this is why they're injecting themselves into the process. So in California, 25%, once 25% of the signatures for the ballot measures are, are um, collected or whatnot, they come in and there's a, 
panel of, of legislators and there's a panel of lay people from, from the public who get to chime in. The thing about it is it gives my uh, opposition constructive notice months before I can even get out and start raising funds. Mm -hmm. So they can mount a campaign against me. And, and so it's, but that's, why would anybody to want that. to mount a uh, campaign against something that would protect children? Every single organization that engages our children will be against this. So every public and private institution Why? that's educational. It's to protect them. Because they have children and they don't have measures in place to protect children. They don't have programs. They've got a, they have a history and a culture of abuse. They know they have problems. They know there's going to be a huge expense for them. And they're, they're afraid. And the insurance companies, you know, to put it in perspective, I mean, these insurance companies for the church have paid billions. Okay. The premiums okay. make them more money than the payouts. That's why they stay in the business. There's always going to be a market. They're always going to serve it. By bringing this ballot measure and having no retroactive consequence, it's basically clearing the past and putting measures in place now and in the future because children are at risk today. So those who've come before, if you're outside of the statute's limitations, you're out of luck. If you're within the current statute's limitations, you will, you will, your case would remain in that. If you're injured after the new law, there will be no statute limitations. I'm doing it this way because I want the greatest chance for success and I want to eliminate the opposition's arguments. So there, you know, it will cost taxpayers nothing. It will not overcrowd prisons. It will not be an overdue burden on the system. It will not be a field day for the attorneys. You know? And also this, this law will give teeth to existing law like Megan's law and Jessica's law, um, sex trafficking laws, mandatory reporting laws. And the law will protect children now and in the future like prepubescent children from pedophiles and then teenage children under 18 or all children under 18 from child pornography and sex trafficking. So how can my viewers help this? Anybody watching this? How can they help this foundation? Well, um, you know, right now where we are with the process of the ballot measure, it's something that, that I don't bring, that, excuse me, that I have to bring personally. My organization, RISE, cannot bring it. That's the law. So we're drafting the, me the measure's been drafted. It's going through the process of approval. Then we need title and summary. So. Maybe I could be on your show another time. We can talk about what people can do specifically. Yeah, anything for that. I can do to help. Um, but in the meantime, what people can do is is visit the website. Um, we're at rise. Would you like to tell them what the website is? Yeah, it's riseaboveabuse.org. Okay. And you know, you can go to that website. You can share your story, uh, read stories of other victims. You can learn a lot about what's going on with the ballot measure. You can learn a lot about different subjects associated with this. And um, you know, we operate on donations. Um, I, I basically have spent my money and some donations that have come in and I need to be writing grants. There's a lot to do. I mean, it's, I'm essentially me and one other person who When volunteers. did you start this foundation? About two and a half years ago. Okay. And how, how large is it now? It's two of us, but it's, you know, it's, it doesn't, it takes a village, but I don't, I like, I don't need to have more than that. It's yeah. like, I'm, I'm running what I'm running and I have a volunteer who helps me. And there's many people peripherally that I engage to help me accomplish the tasks that I need to, to accomplish. But, you know, I'd love to grow this into an organization that, um, that would go worldwide someday. You know? Well, you know, I think that you need publicity because there's so many abused children everywhere. I mean, I'm sure that a large percentage of children <clears throat> have been taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure they're looking for resources such as this that can help. So I think one of the things you can do is start getting the word out there. Absolutely. And you may get a lot more people on board sooner than you think. And there's a lot of projects, I mean, that, that we're working on. You know, I want to bring the ballot measure. I want to start in California and then do it in all 50 states. Um, I'm writing a book. The book's basically, should be coming out next year. Um, I really want people to understand what it's like to live with, with this situation or whatnot. Also producing a documentary that's sort of using my story as a vehicle to um, explore peripheral issues and possible solutions, you know, in the broader spectrum around this. And also follow me through the, the um, process of bringing the ballot initiative. So what is the worst thing, that, apart from the actual incident, that you would say has happened as a result of this? And then what do you say is the best thing? Because I really always look at my life personally, 
when things happen, I try to see the good in it. And I try to identify what is not good about it to protect myself for the future and to share with those that I can help with it. Mm -hmm. um, so what would you say is the absolute worst part of all of this to date? And what is the best? Um, or what is good? It's tough to, to pick like a worse part because I, I sort of look at things that are that are negative as opportunities. Mm -hmm. Me too. So you know, I really think that um, I don't really think there's a worse part. I think okay. there's there's good parts, but there's been challenges that are revealed. I mean, mm -hmm. people. This is something that people don't want to deal with. Um, they just don't want it in their their headspace. You know, my job with everything I'm doing is to try to make this as clear and concise as possible. A very you know, cut and dry lines so people understand exactly what they can do to make a difference. Right. And really it comes down to them just, all you have to know is that it's wrong for, for adults to sexually abuse children, donate some money to the cause and cast your vote. And you can get more involved if you want to be. But my job is to try to make that easy. And there's a challenge for, for making something that's palpable, that people can tolerate, that doesn't put them over the edge, but can also get them engaged. Everybody gets upset. Everybody says, this is an outrage. Someone should do something, you know, and then they take that stand there. And I don't want people standing there. This is a reality. Let's just not get emotional about it. I mean, the motto of, of my organization, like, is common sense, good business. You know, this isn't about vengeance. It's not even about justice. This is about getting it done, fixing this problem, and moving forward. And that's, that's what I want people. I want people to be in that mindset. I want them to be like, Yes, this is terrible. We all know it, but what are we going to do about it? And that's what I think I'm doing. That's different from from most people. You know, I actually have a plan to come through this, and so that's what I need to do. To I need to back up what I'm telling when I'm trying to get people to engage the issue and think about it. I need to back it up with a plan through it, so that they feel like there's going to be resolution. Can you imagine the horrible prison people, pedophiles, must live in? Yeah, I mean. So there's no way that, that, that at some point they don't sit down and look in the mirror and go, I'm a horrible person. I mean, if they don't, it means they've got no conscience. That really makes them dangerous. I, I personally believe that, um, that you know, some of these, the majority of these people are just born this way. Um, some of them have actually been victims too. Some have been victims and, you know, maybe not necessarily of sexual abuse, but other types of abuse. I think most people are not happy this way, um, pedophiles. And I think if you're born that way, you know, they would be the same thing as being born gay and being told that you can't express yourself. I can have some empathy there, you know, but the reality is this society doesn't tolerate adults having sex with children. And, and I think I mentioned before, I, I do believe there's a spectrum. I think that um, possibly some of these people can be managed, you know, with, with a something like AA for alcoholics, something for pedophiles, and that's something else that we've been exploring. But they have to want to. They have and to some want. Some of them, because they can get away with it, they enjoy that lifestyle because it's for them it's empowering. It's a form of power. Yeah, I, I think a program like that has to, you know, involve um, voluntary participation. Mm -hmm. I think anonymity has to be respected. Anonymity has to be respected for these people to get them involved. But I do think it would be the program would involve them going to the police and saying, look, this is who I am. And I think declaring that and taking responsibility for it is a way that some of these people could manage it. Mm -hmm. Well, we're down to our last five minutes. What haven't we covered that you want people to know about? Um, I think just in general, I'd, I'd like people to understand that, you know, this is an issue that's always going to be with us. There are always going to be pedophiles, but people need to be honest with themselves that A, that there is a problem, and that B, there's a way through it, and be willing to do what it takes to get through it, and understand that some of that may not be easy for some people. It may be in conflict with their religious views or their personal views or family, family situation or whatnot, but in the interest of protecting your children and other children in the future and other people's children, whether you have them or not, um, we have an obligation to protect those who can't protect themselves. And there's a, way, there's a way to get this done. And by passing a ballot measure that repeals the statutes of limitations on civil and criminal sex crimes, it's going to put pedophiles on notice that they're never 
free from, from being prosecuted. And it's going to put these institutions on notice that they'll never be safe from liability or prosecution, you know. And I think it'll make a big difference. Yeah. Well, thank you for watching The Jenny Lynn Show. If you're someone who has been abused and you are told if you talk about it that you're going to be killed or your family is going to be killed, it's a lie. There are places and people who can protect you. Do not do what William did and live with the secret for too long. Go get help. There's help everywhere. It's got to be someone you trust. And at the very worst, you can trust the police, I hope. I think you can. I think you can in most cases. And, uh, you know, my email on my phone, I think, I think my phone number as well are on the website. I mean, if you really need Would to Would you please out, say your email on your phone number? My email is will, with two L's, at riseaboveabuse.org. So if you are afraid to call the police or tell your mom or somebody else, call William because he is someone who will empathize and help you. And nobody should allow anybody to dictate the outcome of your life. So if anyone has taken advantage of you, seek help and get yourself taken care of before it's too late. And again, William, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. For bearing really your soul it. on this sofa with me. It's my pleasure. And sharing your story. And I would love to help your organization in any way that I can. If it's just through this medium, please feel free to reach out. And thank you for watching The Jenny Lynn Show. I'm very happy to be back. Thank you. You got a minute and a half left to keep talking. <laughs> so anyway, I'm minute very... minute and a half left to talking. Are you happy? Uh, did, yeah. Did this go good. the way you wanted it to? Yeah, it did. Good. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we will put I, this on our. Do we have a few more? Can I say good. just yeah. one more thing? Yeah. Um, there, there are over 40 million survivors of this in the United States, and what I'm trying to do is give people a reason to come forward, and when you do come forward, the truth will set you free. And there's truly an army of us that, that can transform this issue and transform other social issues as well. So don't be afraid to come forward. Just come, come and let it be. Don't live in the prison of abuse. Thank you.